Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. The last time I did this up at the Wilson House, I, um, I, met, I'm, I, I tried really to prepare. For weeks ahead of time, I tried to prepare for this, and I'd, I'd sit down with the big book, and I'd, and I'd sit down with paper and pen, and I just, not, I just could not get anything down. Just couldn't. So here I am. I'm at the retreat, right? Now, I'm doing the 12th step. <laughs> I'm last, and I'm trying to listen to everybody else and figure out what the heck I'm going to say. So I'm sitting there with pen and paper the whole time. I'm making notes about what's being said. I'm trying to make my own notes. It's just not working. Finally, I gave up. And then about maybe five minutes before it was my turn to get up on to, to talk, I started jotting stuff down. And I got up there and I said, you know, I just made notes, which I'm, you know, probably not going to follow, which I don't really think I did too much. And what I discovered is that what actually came out is what God wanted to happen. And although I did translate those notes just so that I can make sure that at least I did hit some high points, uh, we're just going to see what God decides is going to happen tonight. So, we'll just go with that. Um, <clears throat> I am Mindy. I'm an alcoholic. And my, my day of grace is the 6th day of February 1988. And uh, I, I really, you know, I'm not from New Jersey. Um, I like to always say that uh, I'm from South Jersey. Uh, but that depends on where I say that. If I'm in South Jersey, they're like, hmm, no, that's just not working with them. So, um, but no, I'm from I'm from Texas, uh, and um, and we had, we have, you know, there's the Bible Belt down there, but there's also a Big Book Belt, and um, and I kind of came from from that area. I came from really it's Joe and Charlie country, and I didn't know Joe and Charlie was Joe and Charlie until I moved to New Jersey and discovered that they're pretty, you know, they're pretty big. They travel all over the place. I just thought it was Joe and Charlie and they did this big book thing and I saw them in meetings and all that good stuff and, and it was really great. Um, so I was pretty surprised when my parents discovered that, that, that um, I really was in a really good spot down there. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But uh, when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous in February 1988, I started off as a deficit, and the reason I did that is because, you see, I didn't like men, and I didn't like women, and that seems to be all we had in Texas at the time when I came in alcohol time. Um, so I was started off as a deficit, so, you know, I heard this thing get a sponsor, so I figured I would pick the lesser of two evils, so I got a man as a sponsor. And it's because, you know, I, I just, I didn't trust women at all. I just didn't trust you. I didn't trust men either, but I figured I could control you, old boy. So that's, that's how come I felt more comfortable. So I got Mac as a sponsor. And um, I don't know why this happened, but, but, but Mac said to me, he said, you know, if you want to stop drinking and you want to stop hurting, you'll do everything I tell you to do. Because if I tell you to stand in the middle of the road, paint your butt red, you'll do it. And I said, yes, sir. And I don't know how that happened. Um, and we kind of got to reading in the book a little bit, and um, he kind of had me start working on my fourth step, and he said, and that was real soon, and he said, now it's time for you to get a woman as a sponsor. And I said, now, wait a minute. Now, this is not what I signed up for, you know. You know how I feel about women. How am I going to get a woman as a sponsor? He goes, oh, that's easy. You get the woman you're most afraid of. Well, I knew immediately who that was. That was Diane. Diane was not, you know, standing in my stocking feet. I'm six foot two. Diane standing in heels is five foot two of fat. And let me tell you something. This woman was in every meeting I went to. She had a big mouth. She was, she had been GCR. At the time, she was DCM. She knew the steps, the traditions, and God forbid the 12 concepts of world service, not anymore, nothing to do with her. So I knew that had to be my sponsor. So I walked up to her one day, and I said, Diane, would you be my sponsor? And she said, oh, I'd love to. <laughs> and it just, that's the nicest thing she ever said to me. It just went downhill from there. 
She never once asked me what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go, what I thought about something, what time I wanted to get there, or what time I wanted to leave. She never asked me any of that. She just told me where to go, where to be, what to think, what to say, what not to say. And, and the main thing she told me was just shut up. Just shut up. And then when you're done doing that, shut up. And above all, remember this, shut up. So that's, that's my uh, 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 story about getting a woman as a sponsor. Um, I know that on page 100 it says in the big book that the, 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 uh, what a sponsor is supposed to do is walk hand in hand with a new man this path. And the path is the path of recovery. And the path of recovery is in the first 100 and well, 164 pages big book. The 12th, I think the 12th step ends at 123 or something like that. Somebody would know better than me. But that's the job of the sponsor. Now, um, my sponsor said to me, this is both Mac and Diane. They're really kind of co-sponsoring me. See, I just, I needed, I was real stubborn. I kind of needed both. And, uh, I said, they said, I said, you know, really what is a sponsor? Is it a friend? And Diane said to me, you know what, if you want a friend, get a dog, you know, but I'm your sponsor. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the truth. And I'm going to tell you the truth, whether you hate me for the rest of your life or not. Because I'll tell you one thing, I would rather have you hate me sober than love me drunk. And that's what she told me. She says, a friend may not tell you the truth, and you may die, but I'm not going to be your friend. I'm going to tell you the truth, and I'm going to risk you hating me for the rest of your life. And I'm like, great, great. <laughs> oh, great. Um, what I've come to learn now is that there are, there are two things in AA. There is the text, the program of recovery that's in the first 164 pages, and then there is the oral tradition of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, what I did not know... And again, after I've, just, I've discovered this in hindsight, is that I was being taught the oral tradition of Alcoholics Anonymous. Fortunately, it was in an area that was surrounded by a lot of big books. And we were very big convention goers. I mean, every weekend we were at a convention. And it would be like, you know, you get a Motel 6 and, um, and you get, you know, 15 people in a car meant for four. And you get a room meant for four people, and you put 20 in it. And you don't have any money, so you bring a cooler, and you put milk in it and PBJ, and that's what you had for breakfast. And that's just what we did at every convention. And nobody didn't get a chance to go. And so we got to hear a lot of the circuit speakers, the big circuit speakers who just are, would travel all over down in Texas and we would travel to see them. And fortunately I got to hear that and my sponsors would give me tapes. They gave me tapes of, God forbid Clancy, alright Clancy, and they would give me tapes of, of Joe, they would give me tapes of, of, of Joe and Charlie, they would give, of course I saw them all the time anyway. They would give me, um, Cersei. I mean, I just, you know, I could just name a, a million of them. And, um, and they told me this. They said, you know what? When we're not around to tell you how to live your life, you put these tapes in and you listen to everything they said. Um, and, and you do everything they tell you to do. And you just pretend like they're your sponsors. So sometimes when I say my sponsors told me this, whatever it is, I'm not really sure. Where I heard it from. <laughs> it could be a Tate. It could be Mac. It could be Diane. It could be any of those. But that's really kind of how I sobered up, was listening to the speaker tapes. I know Jim G was big, very important to me. Keith Drum is very important to me as well. Um, so this is, so I grew up listening to that and then just picking up the big book and, and reading it from what I had understood from, uh, from those tapes. So I learned how to stay sober through the oral tradition of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now then, um, and they were very strict on me, and, and they kicked me in the rear end, and the only thing they ever did was really save my life, because I'll tell you something. I needed every bit of what they gave me, and I didn't know that this was going to have to happen. 
But um, I ended up moving to New Jersey, and um, and uh, it, none of that is my fault at all. That was that was my husband's fault, and since he's just six feet in the ground now, I can just blame it all on him. He's not here to to defend himself, so I'm very pleased about being able to not have to argue about that. Um, but you know, so here I I come to New Jersey, and um, and so I'm coming in, and I'm a you know I'm a big book thumper, right? You know, I'm a and, and I know how to stay sober. Now. Even though I sobered up with the oral tradition, it was very, it was pretty closely related to the big book. So one of the things my sponsors did say to me was, they said, now, don't you go up there and tell them they're doing it wrong. Now, I don't have any idea what gave them the idea I was going to do that. But that's what they told me. So I got up here, and let me tell you something. I started talking in meetings. I'd raise my hand in big book meetings. And, you know, y'all weren't very nice to me. I just, you know, I was told that y'all, y'all might not be so nice, but I figured it was probably just the accent, you know, that y'all had, that uh, that just kind of, it kind of would sound a little curt, and you didn't weren't really mean, meaning to be rude. You just sounded rude, but I, I just, I just wasn't received very well at all, and um, and uh, so I, I, I quite couldn't understand this, so I finally found page seventeen. Page 17 in the big book. And um, since I have, I'm really bad about memorizing stuff and typically can't find anything that I'm looking for in the big book, um, I always know it's on the left or the right-hand side of the page at the top or the bottom, somewhere in the middle or the third of the book, and that's about as far as you're going to get me to go. Um, if I can figure out what step that sentence is talking about, then I can maybe figure out what chapter. Anyway, but on um, page 17 is the first it's the it's the first uh, page of uh, the second chapter. There is a solution, and it talks about the um, the Titanic, in that you know they thrown into the water, and everybody's got something in common now. Joy, right? Everybody's got something in common. But it says that that in itself would never have held us together as we're now joined. The tremendous fact that we have a common solution, and that's the, the big book, the program of recovery. Well, now here's the problem: is that um, I didn't realize that there were two Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't realize that there was the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and then the Program of Recovery of Alcoholics Anonymous until I moved to the area that I moved to um, in, in New Jersey. And, um, and there was a lot of fellowshipping going on, but I found myself in a very difficult spot in that I wasn't hearing m much recovery um, like I was used to. And as a result of that, I, you know, the good thing that Diane had given me is she had given me a, um, she had given me the freedom to have a big mouth. Not that I didn't have one anyway, but, um, but she gave me the freedom to speak my mind. And she always said that you need to be able to stand for what you believe is true, but you need to remember that if you're going to do that, sometimes you're going to stand alone. And she says you're the only one that can stay sober in your own skin. You're the only one that's got to go to bed with yourself sober or, or drunk, and you're the only one that's got to wake up with yourself sober or drunk. And so, therefore, what I had to do was I had to be the most unpopular person in that county because <laughs> that's how far I looked for meetings. And um, it, it was, it, and, I'll, and I'll, let me give you an example of how difficult it was for me. I was in a big book meeting one time, and we were talking about whatever step it was we were talking about. And uh, they were going around the room, and they'd read a paragraph and then talk about, well, you know, what happened at work today. And then and then they'd read another paragraph, and then they'd talk about, well, you know, it's his fault. And they'd read another paragraph, and then they'd say, well, it's her fault. And then they'd come to me, and I started talking about, you know, let's just say it was step, you know, two, and, and, I, and I'm just been talking about step two and all that, and... I was interrupted. I was interrupted by a guy that had about 40 years sober, and he happened to be the one that was kind of the guru of the area. And he said to me this. He said, as his face got really red and the veins were popping out of his neck, he said, we don't talk about the steps in a big book meeting. If you want to talk about the steps, you go to a step meeting. It is not necessary to work the steps in order to stay sober. 
I am 41 years sober, and I have never worked a step. And I thought to myself, yeah, I can see that. And he said, we don't want people like you in our meeting. And I thought to myself, I don't think I want to come back here, but I still didn't stop thumping the book because it's the only thing that I knew. I also knew that just from this sponsorship that I had, I knew that I can create the, fel I can create the fellowship that I crave. And the way that I do that is if I can't find it, I create it. So I started sponsoring. And I sponsored and I sponsored and I sponsored. And, and it was, it was fun. Um, it was, um, it was, uh, <laughs> I have to turn the page here because I'm really going to get off track if I don't. Um, I, I had responsibilities as a sponsor, just like my sponsor did. Um, but before I get into that, I have to tell you that one of the, one of the side effects that I discovered moving to New Jersey um, and not being around the, the, the type of recovery that I was used to is that I developed spiritual arrogance. And when I developed that spiritual arrogance, what, what happened to me was I, did not, I became unteachable. And I had been unable to find a sponsor. And I had tried, I can say now I tried about 25 to 30 women to sponsor me over a period of about um, I'm, I'm thinking now 12 years, 12, 13 years, 12 years, however long I'm here. I can't do the math. But um, about that long, I, I, I tried that many women um, to, to sponsor me, and, and it just didn't work. So here I am. My sponsor in back in Texas said, if you're sponsoring yourself, you're being sponsored by an idiot. So therefore, me and the idiot sponsor, myself, um, were had to figure some of this stuff out. And what I discovered is I, I had spiritual arrogance. And I had to monitor myself in a way that I said, you know what? These people who don't have a program and don't know anything about the 12 steps of the recovery are staying sober. And I am getting sicker. And what's wrong with this picture? So I decided, with the help of, you know, I think I had, I think I've had, I have had a 15-year grace period. That is just my belief now. I've been sober for 15 years, and I think I've had a 15-year grace period. Um, but I figured that I needed to keep my mouth shut in, a, in every meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous until I could become teachable. And it took me two years before I could speak in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm just a tad bit stubborn. So until I could open my mouth where I wasn't preaching at you and I wasn't telling you how to work, live your life and work your program. And that if I couldn't learn something from somebody in a meeting, then I was in trouble. Not you, me. I was in trouble. So I had to start sponsoring. And, um, which was kind of an interesting because uh, it's like, <laughs> welcome to sobriety, newcomer. Here I am. Um, now, here are the rules that I have. We're going to meet once a week. We're going to read the big book. We're going to work the step when we get to it. You need to get a job if you don't have one. Uh, if you're not in a relationship, you can't get in one until after you work the ninth step. Um, if you're having an affair, we're going to have to talk about that. Um, if you're, uh, you know, don't make any major decisions in the first year. Um, Shut up, mainly shut up, and um, you need to uh, you need to have your home group the same one as mine. You need to go to certain meetings that I suggest that you go to. If your job schedule doesn't fit that, you need to change it. Um, you need to make a decision. What's the most important thing in your life? Anything you put in front of your sobriety, you will lose. And um, so you can see how you know originally people thought this was great because you know, hey, I sounded great in meetings, right? But, oh, boy, she means business. Oh, well, we have to really change our lifestyle here to be sober. And because um, this is what was required of me. So uh, I can give you an example uh, uh, of, of some people that I sponsored in their, in their first year. Um, there's a girl that um, uh, I'll just I'll call her, you know, Johanna for 
for uh, purposes of anonymity or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, she, she had said to me after a period of time, she really just trying to get away from me. She really was. But she just couldn't quite fire me. So what she said to me was this. She says, you know, you know, I just, I just don't feel like we're bonding. I don't feel like we're bonding. And I said to her, well, what, good, my goodness, you feel that way. Um, I don't think bonding is a requirement for sponsorship. So I'll see you next week, and here's your homework. And this is kind of how it went with me and her. And uh, one day, uh, we were meeting, and she didn't have a car, so I was going to her. And we were meeting on a Thursday, and I went to where she was living, and I knocked on the doors, no answer. I'm like, all right. Uh, no answer, no answer. I waited and waited, and uh, I saw her about two weeks later. I'm like, I'm, you know, I'll call her, and then that's about it. I saw her about two weeks later in a meeting. I'm like, where you been? She goes, oh, well, I moved. I said, is that right? <laughs> Did you realize that we meet on Thursdays like we have been for the last six months? And then she was like, oh, I didn't tell you. I'm like, no. So, see. This is the extremes that she, the actions that she was going to go to to get rid of me. She wanted, she moved on me. So, um, and then, of course, there was, there's, there's this girl um, who uh, just kept trying to ditch me and couldn't quite figure out how to do it. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it, she just kept relapsing. She was a chronic relapser, 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 relapser. And I don't know how come it was that I kept getting stuff with all the girls that relapsed. I, and they're re all the young ones. I couldn't figure that out. But anyway, she, she asked me to be her sponsor. And we were meeting once a week, reading the big book, working the stuff when we get to it. And just something was off. Something just wasn't right. And um, I figured she was using She She denied it. But I guess it was about, um, it was time for us to meet. She was a half an hour late, and I called her. And she goes, well, you know, I don't have a ride. I'm like, well, you know what, I'll be right over. I'll pick you up. And she said, no, no, that's okay. You know, I'm, I'm thinking that they're going to come. I said, well, I'll tell you what, we've only got a certain amount of time this evening. We really have to get to the next step that we're working on um, cause, because we haven't been able to meet. So, therefore, I'm coming over. And I heard something in her voice that was like panic. And I thought, hmm, what to do? So I called another uh, woman in the program who I'd made friends with, and I said, meet me over there because she's using, and we're going to need to take her to the depot. So she met me over there, and, you know, uh, and that's exactly what we did, and cleaned out her place, and it was terrible. So, you know, these are some of the, some of the things that I've experienced with, with newcomers. There's also one girl who, um, who, uh, you know, one of the things that she, she kept telling me, she said, you know, uh, I don't have a boyfriend, and I don't, I don't have a college degree, and I don't have an apartment of my own. I'm living with my parents, and, and I, I, don't, I don't have, a, I don't have a, a job that I like and, and, and all this. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, why don't you get a job? And um, I said, if you, you know, we worked with the steps, and I said, if you, you'll, you'll become who it is that you want to attract, then you'll probably attract that as far as the relationship is concerned. I said, but I'm telling you something, you're not going to attract somebody too terribly appealing if you still live in a home with Mama, because he's probably living at home with Mama. So I said, I tell you what, I said, why don't you, I'll give you a year, I'll give you one year, and you need to have an apartment on your own. And you need to be self-supporting through your own contributions, like the seventh tradition, which is what my sponsor told me to do, because I was in mood to have to be self-supporting through my own contributions. And I said, I, but I, I said, my sponsor gave me a week. I'm giving you a year. And, and I said, don't you think that's fair? She said, yeah, I think that's pretty fair. And I said, you know, even if that means you've got to, you have to get a roommate. Now, we're driving on the parkway, and I'm headed to do a big book study. It's a 16-week big book study, Joe and Charlie Tate's, for a women's group. And we're going about 45 miles down the parkway. And she starts to throw temper tantrum. I'm not sharing my stuff with anybody else. I don't want my, 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 me, 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 I, I, I. So I let her go on about this and throw in a temper tantrum and... We got to the meeting, and she goes, I'm not going in. Fine, I'm going in. i got to run this group. 
she comes in late. She storms through the door. She throws her book bag down. I'd already told the women there, you know, she's throwing a temper tantrum. Let's act accordingly. So they completely ignored her. And um, we got up to say the, to say the Lord's Prayer. I'm not saying the Lord's Prayer. It's religious. And I, I'm not religious. So, okay, we have a solution for that. We'll say the serenity prayer. And she's very quiet for a second. And she goes, I'm not saying that either. So um, we got back in the car. And she started p pounding on the steering wheel. And, and you know, I just don't know what overcame me. But I prayed just before this happened. So maybe it was God. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, I have to make an impact here somehow. And I don't think there's just any words that I'm going to be able to say too much. So God, whatever you want. So we were at a stoplight, and as I was coming, in, in, and the light turned green, and as I was coming around, we were getting on the, onto the parkway, there was some gravel off to the side of the road, and it just kind of occurred to me in about a half a split second, and I just punched it. And then I slammed on my brakes, and we skidded into the side of the road, and her head went like this, and I looked at her and I said, get out of the car. And she said, oh, here, fine, here's your, here's your damn quarter to put in the thing. I'm like, no, it's too late for that. Get out of the car. And she said, no. So I said, oh, yes, you'll get out of the car. If I have to come over there and drag you out, you're getting out of the car. So get out of the car. So I opened the door, and she got out, and, and, uh, and I said, you need to just call Mommy. Go call Mommy and have Mommy come pick you up. So, of course, I saw her get on her cell phone on the side of the road, and I knew the first call was to me on my, cell, on my, on my answering machine at home. And I did keep that, that message for a very long time uh, and played it for her after a while. And I... Uh, you know, what she says, what, what she had said, at, you know, at, about three weeks later, because we did a little study neglect with her, because she had never really realized that her actions would, she was always very intimidating to other people. She didn't realize that her actions were, were, were going to have consequences and that she was going to lose friends as a result of her behavior. And, and we, it, we ignored her for about two weeks just to let her see what it felt like. And then I walked up to her and I said, are you done yet? And she said, yeah, I'm done. And she just flew through the steps for the remainder of the time that I was able to sponsor her. And um, so, you know, sponsorship is fun sometimes. Um, so uh, well, I, I think that, you know, the longer that you that, that I, I've been, finally, now, I, I have a sponsor. It, you know, after all these years, of praying, I prayed for a sponsor before I came to New Jersey, prayed for one while I was here, and when I said, you know, screw it, I'm not going to pray for a sponsor anymore, one shows up in my life. And, uh, and she said to me that advanced sponsorship is really teaching the person to trust their instincts. Um, not, I don't have to tell them what to do anymore, and I don't have, I, I just have to ha ha tell them how to apply what's actually in the book. And for most of the years that I was in, that I was a sponsor, it was mainly with newcomers. I mean, really newcomers. Um, chronic relapsers. And I really never was able to get someone to the point of advanced sponsorship. Um, because it was the type of sponsorship that I was doing was not readily supported in the area, and um, and they didn't have a lot of uh, they didn't have a lot of support, and they didn't have anybody to hang out with, and you know there was they were it's so, it's so vastly different, so it was a little bit difficult. Um, I don't know how long I'm supposed to go here. Is there a time that I'm supposed to? Uh uh. <laughs> Another half hour. <laughs> That's not right. Um, <laughs> okay, so forget the notes now. Um, because that's pretty much, that's really kind of been my experience with first year sponsorship. Um, is that, and I've got to tell you right now, uh, think, think, 
about a year and a half ago, has it been a year and a half? It's just a year and a half. About a year and a half ago, I was in an incredible amount of pain. It was uh, like five years after, five, four, four years after the death of my husband, and um, I was in, uh, not very good for that, man. Anyway, uh, and I, I was in the worst pain that I'd ever been in my entire life. And I said to God, I said, you know what, God, I'll tell you what, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. Um, and uh, and I'll, put, I'll take anybody out of my life. I'll put anybody into my life. I'll work in, I'll quit my job. I'll work in any industry you want me to work in, but I can't go on living the way that I'm living. And within two weeks, I had a sponsor, I had Spisters, I had the Burnsville Group, I had Chris, I had a new job where I worked with newcomers all day long, chronic relapsers that don't want to be sober. They didn't ask me to sponsor them. They didn't ask me to be in their lives. So, <laughs> I don't know about advanced sponsorship anymore, but, um, but thank God that... Uh, I'm being sponsored again, brand new, and I'm being taken through the book again as though it's my first year. Um, it took about a uh, uh, about this year and a half for me to kind of wake up from the sleep that I had been in, from the the depth and the darkness of the pain that I had experienced, and um, and now I'm I'm uh, I'm beginning to work through. This through the big book again from the beginning, word for word, page by page with my sponsor so that I'm going to be able to do it with not only the girls that I work with now, but for some reason I put me with all the young ones and I have the young women's group. I just can't get away from it. And, um, uh, and I'm learning it all over again. And I'm learning it with 15 years of experience of knowing what, what it good sobriety sounds like, and knowing what not to do. And um, that's, I really, that I think that's really all I got, Chris. I don't know how much, further, how much more time I'm really supposed to spend. So, I appreciate you having me here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.